Hello, everyone, and happy February. Am I the only one that is having trouble believing that January is already gone? Has everyone stuck to their New Year's resolutions? I didn't exactly have a New Year's resolution, but I really wanted to focus on being more healthy and getting the best out of my time at the gym and feeling better when I hike. I recently found First Form, and they have been an amazing addition to my fitness lifestyle. They have amazing products. I've added things like protein, vitamins, pre-workout, and even post-workout, especially when hiking or doing a hard workout at the gym. And I am loving their products. I feel less tired, and I feel like I can get the most out of my workouts. Also, their workout clothes are so comfy, and they look amazing. Please go to the link in our show notes and take a look at some of the amazing products that they have. You won't regret doing something for you in order to get the most out of your fitness. Also, if you use the link in our show notes, it supports us as well. If you have any questions about what I use or how I get the best out of my time, just send me a DM. All right, let's get to this week's episode. Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. Today we are talking about William Bradford, the Death Valley murders. We still have construction going on, so... If you hear noise in the background, we are so terribly sorry. I'm not. Maddie's not very concerned about it, but it's driving me absolutely insane. You probably can't hear half of it, but it's really loud. Today, we are going to be talking about the Death Valley murders, and this is going to start with Sherry Miller, who had graduated from Culver High School in California, and she graduated at the top of her class. She was outgoing and loved by all who met her. She had dreams of becoming a model. And around the 4th of July weekend in 1984, Sherry had stopped by to visit her mom and told her about a customer that she had met at her work. She's a waitress at the Meat Market Bar in downtown Los Angeles. She said that she had told him about her dreams of being a model and that he had said that he wanted to take pictures of her for a motorcycle magazine And she was going to meet with him at the bar where she worked. And her mom didn't love this idea, but she said that his name was Bill and that everybody seemed to know him and she wasn't worried about it at all. Also, according to her mom, Sherry had been having a rough time and was actually living out of her car at the time. But she seemed to be in good spirits and kind of just trudging along. On July 6th, a body would be found wrapped in a blanket and dumped in an alley behind a carpet store in West Los Angeles. She had her hands bound in the front with leather shoelaces. Mm -hmm. What? Leather shoelaces? Mm -hmm. So she had her hands bound in front of her with leather shoelaces. Never seen a fucking leather shoelace in my life. It's like uh, they have them on like those like lace up boots sometimes that are laced up. It's like a really skinny leather shoelace. You don't see that very much anymore, but they used to be. Oh, really like popular. the round ones? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was nude and she had the skin cut away from her calf and abdomen. Right. Like just Ooh, a like, chunk of skin was cut off. Like a patch? Yep. Or like she was opened up like autopsy style? No, like a patch. Okay. There was nothing to identify who the victim might be, and she would be labeled Jane Doe number 60. They also found yellow paint under her fingernails, and there was no missing persons report that matched this victim. So six days after Jane Doe number 60 was found, so this is on July 12th, 15-year-old Tracy Campbell would go missing. She lived in an apartment with her mother, brother, and her 19-year-old cousin. Her cigarettes and purse were still on the counter. And yes, she is 15. What year are we in? 1984? That's not I crazy. I feel like everybody in the But 80s. they're just like on the counter. Like her mom knows that she smokes at 15. Like if as a person who lived in the 80s, I would have hid that shit from my mom. Okay. All of the beds were unmade, which was one of Tracy's chores. Why is Tracy making all of the beds? That's weird. It sounds to me when I was reading about it that all the beds were like in one room. 
just like mattresses on the ground and her one of her daily chores because I don't think she was going to school was to like make the beds and tidy up and she was usually really good about that but that hadn't been done this day okay so yeah this this concerned the family because she would not leave without doing her chores so also Tracy was a bit of a loner since they were new to LA and they didn't think that there was anyone that she would be out with So, like, if she was out, she'd be out by herself, but she left her cigarettes in her purse. So, like, she's not out by herself. Like, this is strange. She doesn't have any friends. Now, they did not immediately call police in the hopes that she would walk through the door at any moment. They did go knocking on doors, including a neighbor named William Bradford, who lived next door. They only kind of knew him as he had offered to take pictures of Tracy in the past. He drove a motorcycle had a nice car, and rolled his cigarettes in the sleeve of his white t-shirts. There was no answer when they knocked on his door, though, and when her family did call police, they suggested that they go talk to Bradford. But when police went and knocked on his door, there was no answer. The next morning, Tracy's cousin would go back to Bradford's apartment where he would find a note on the door. So nobody answered, but there's this note on the door, and it says, The girl next door is missing, and I hope to God you had nothing to do with it. He thought that the note might have been written by Bradford's roommate, which is so fucking disturbing. No matter who wrote this note, it's disturbing. The family waits for him to come home, hoping that Tracy would be with him. But he was alone, and the family did confront him and thought that he seemed very cagey. So when police go to the apartment later that day, Bradford is home. He says that he has no idea where Tracy is, but he does admit that he saw her in the morning of the 12th, Mm -hmm. which Which, is the morning she went missing. Yep. And when she had knocked on his door asking to use the phone, so he said that when she was done using the phone, he dropped her off at the local liquor store to buy cigarettes. Mm. Suspicious. Her cigarettes are on the counter, buddy. You're... mm, 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 mm. Is it a new pack on the counter? I would be curious. Yes, it's, it's, it's... Almost a full pack on the counter. Okay, so maybe it is the pack that she bought at the liquor store and she went home. So you're thinking maybe he did drop her off, she bought cigarettes, and then went home and then disappeared after that? Yeah. Okay, well, gotcha. that's that, that gotcha. could be, like, right now, if it's a full pack of cigarettes, like, it could be. It's not, like, a brand new pack, but it still has a lot of cigarettes in it. It's described as, like, a mostly full pack. Okay. All right. Well, I'd be curious to know how new it looks because, you know, you can tell with a pack of cigarettes. Either way, this could mean that he was the last person to see her. Now, he did not tell her family this when they questioned him that day. Yeah, but that's the story that he tells police. Police are suspicious of Bradford right away. And not just because he may be the last person to see her, but remember that she had a full pack of cigarettes and also her purse was there. So how would she have bought the cigarettes? This is assuming that she didn't go home afterward. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about that. That's so funny. What? That she might have gone home afterward. Yeah. When I was researching this, I never even thought of that. I was thinking, like, maybe she went home after. No, like, if his story is real. That's a great point. I never even thought of it. Police would question him further and take a look at his record. And on his record, they would find that he was currently out on bond facing a rape charge. The charge came from his ex-girlfriend, Julian Peters, who said that he had beat her, forced her to drink poison, and raped her. Also, he had been charged with indecent exposure, a DUI, burglary, and sexual battery. Castrate. (laughs) Castrate. We're just going to every episode now, Madison's going to be like, somebody needs to be castrated. Hey, is it not? I think (sighs) it would be a successful form to get people to stop doing things, like, right? Like... This would, however, give police probable cause for a search warrant on Bradford's apartment, storage locker, and his car. Because he's out on parole. They can basically do anything they want at this point. When searching his apartment, police find more than 50 photos of women posing for the camera, which wasn't that strange since he boasted of being a professional photographer. There was, however, one photo that drew the attention of one of the detectives. He thought that she looked familiar. Maybe a little like the Jane Doe number 60 case that he had been working on. One of the things that he found compelling about the picture was a tattoo 
that she had on her calf and abdomen. So he cut off her tattoos. The tattoos. Yep. Bradford would tell police that the woman in the picture was Sherry Miller. And when they contacted her mother, who didn't even know that her daughter was missing yet, she would tell them the story of a photographer named Bill that her daughter was supposed to meet with around the time that she went missing. Police would go back to Bradford, and he would admit to photographing Sherry, but said that it had been months earlier in Topanga State Park and said that he knew nothing about her murder. They had nothing to hold him on and would be forced to let him go, but they would survey him 24-7. So basically, they're like, yeah, you're suspicious as shit, and we are going to be watching you. Also, I feel like the castration is a great oh my God. threat to people for them to tell the truth. One of the pictures of Sherry had a seal-shaped rock formation in the background, and police would work on trying to track down the location of this photo. But they could not find it in Topanga, where he said they had gone. Because it's not fucking in Topanga. Yep. Because he murdered her really recently. So they were able to find a friend of Bradford's who recognized the rock because he had camped there before with Bradford. And after they were camping, Bradford asked him to draw a map of the site so, like, he could get back there by himself. Uh-huh. So, I don't like that. Mm-mm. When police find the campsite, they have trouble finding the rock. But after hours of searching, they would locate it. So, like, this is a pretty hidden spot. Right. And I will also tell you now, they are not in Topanga National Park. They Death are Valley. in Death Valley, by the way, in case you were wondering. So, they did have trouble finding the rock, but after hours of searching, they would locate it. And when they do so, they're met with a horrid scene. It is the body of Tracy Campbell. She was in a shallow grave about 100 yards from the rock. And she was covered with some large rocks, and she had been mummified by the desert heat. Right, so where the picture of Sherry was taken... They find Tracy's body, the 15-year-old that went missing, in the same spot where Sherry's last known picture was taken. So she had been strangled and had ligature marks, indicating that she had been tied up before her death. She had a blouse tied over her face and neck. And her family did not recognize that blouse, but guess what? A friend of Sherry's would recognize it. Right, because she had actually given the shirt to Sherry. So they arrested him at the meat market bar. And this is the same place that he had met Sherry. This is where Sherry was working. This was Sherry's bar. Yep. Police believe that on the 4th or 5th, Bradford had met Sherry at the bar that was two blocks from his apartment and left her car there. Because that's where her car was, by the way. The pair then rode in his car to the remote campground in the desert where he had taken her photo before strangling her with her own bootlaces. After which, he sliced off the flesh from her calf and abdomen before dumping her in the alley. So she couldn't be identified. Which kind of worked for a while. I mean, it, it kept her from being reported missing sooner. Yeah. And if he hadn't done that, if she had been identified sooner, Tracy, they might have caught up to him before Tracy went missing. In 1987, William Bradford would be tried for murdering both Tracy and Sherry, and the trial would last for four months with testimony from 60 prosecution witnesses. They really didn't have any physical evidence, and the case would mostly be circumstantial. One of Bradford's attorneys would say, I very strongly think that they're wrong. They took two weak cases and put them together. And they really wouldn't offer a defense and said that the prosecution had not proved its case. So basically they're saying, we don't really have to prove our defense because they don't have a case, mm -hmm. is what they said. So what did the prosecution have? They did find some of Sherry's belongings in a storage locker belonging to Bradford, but he claimed that she had left them in his car after their photo shoot. He doesn't have a car. He has a motorcycle. He also has a car, but he also drives a motorcycle because he's cool. 
They found her belt. They found jewelry, a knife, and her boots. Guess what? Her boots are also missing their laces. Suspicious. Remember, she had laces tied around her. They also found a Mickey Mouse watch that matched one that Sherry owned, and it had yellow paint splatters on it. Just a couple days before her disappearance, Sherry had helped some people paint a house for some extra money. And guess what? The house was yellow. And remember, there were also flecks of the same paint found under Sherry's fingernails. When his ex-wife Cindy testified that he was abusive, he would become enraged and fire his defense counsel, after which he decided to represent himself. I love when they represent themselves. Always a good idea. Although you know what representing himself did give him? Hmm. The ability to cross-examine his ex-wife, which apparently he did very aggressively. I don't like that. The eight-woman four-man jury would deliberate for 12 days before declaring him guilty. Thank God. Bradford would sit with his chin resting in his hands and never look in their direction. After being led away, he said, God knows I didn't do it. (laughs) Okay, so during his sentencing, he actually asked for the death penalty. Oh, good for fucking you. And said, think of how many you don't even know about You are so right. That's it. In other words, he's trying to, like, say, I deserve the death penalty because there are more victims is basically what I'm getting out of that. So he's trying not to get... He's using reverse psychology Yeah, Mm -hmm. He's saying, I want the death penalty, but, you know, just kill me because you don't even know how many girls I've killed, and you'll never know, so just kill me. Yeah. The prosecutor, David Kahn, said that, in quotes, he was the scariest defendant I've ever prosecuted. He said that they all knew that there were more victims and that they couldn't afford to lose this case or there could be even more victims added to his list. Um, while being led away, he claimed that he was responsible for killing Misha Stewart. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, Bradford has been called a serial killer, which if you look at his convictions, he does technically qualify for this. The FBI says that a serial killer is defined by the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender in separate events. So even if he doesn't have more victims out there, he would technically be considered a serial killer at this point. I didn't know it was that low. Two or more? Mm -hmm. That seems really low to me, like a low bar for that. But did you know that every state in the U.S. has produced at least two serial killers and some many more? Yes. The U.S. has produced the most serial killers in the world at more than 2,700. England is second with 145. Think about that for a second. Also think about how big the U.S. is, though. Wait, it gets worse, The though. U.S. is huge. South Africa is third. Canada is fourth. In the U.S., California is the highest with 120 serial killers. And then if you go back, Alaska is the highest per capita at 51 serial killers. Mm -hmm. So Alaska is the most dangerous place to live. You also have to consider that reporting and tracking might differ in other countries. So we're saying we're the scariest. We probably are. But we also don't know how they track these things in other countries, especially through like the 80s. And it wasn't until the 70s that we really even started paying attention to serial killers. So who knows what the real numbers are. But since the 1980s, serial killers have declined in the U.S. by 85%. I just think they're better at hiding. Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Robert Hansen, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez. Some would say Charles Manson. I don't know if I agree with that, but... About 40% of serial killers get away with it, and that is from 2019, not the 70s or 80s. So in 2019, 40% of serial killers were getting away with their killings. Yeah. That's scary. It is. Bishop was sentenced to death, and he would be sent to San Quentin. His execution date was set for August 18 of 1988, but he would hire counsel to help speed up his execution, claiming that he wanted to hurry up and die. 
but five days before his execution, he would change his mind and declare that he was innocent. Um, I want to talk about the photos. Yeah, the photos found in Bradford's apartment, you guys. So there are hundreds of pictures of women posing for the camera, and police would eventually get back around to the box, uh, but it would take, like, 22 fucking years. So after 22 years, somebody's like, hey, maybe we should take a look at this again. So police decided that they needed to release some of the pictures to the public in hoping to identify some of these girls. The first picture board would have 54 pictures on it, and police were hoping to determine if any of these women were victims or if they were alive or, you know... Right, because they have no idea who the women in these pictures are at all. Yeah, hoping for any kind of identification at all on right. these women. So when they release the photos, each woman was given a number. There is a lot of Farrah Fawcett hair. Most of the women are smiling and do not seem like they are in distress. But, shit, we don't know what happens after. There is one where a woman's wearing an Uncle Sam hat. There's a couple with cowboy hats on. Now, when plus they receive more than 2,000 tips from all over the country. Can you imagine being in one of these photos? By the end of the campaign, they were able to identify 34 with a degree of confidence. 28 of the 34 that they were able to identify were alive and well. Only two of them were known homicide victims. Want to take a guess at who might have killed them? One woman called in to say that she was picture number 16 and 17. Number eight was a model named Tina Teets. She would say that in 1984, Bishop photographed her, and she would say that he gave her a bad vibe, and she never wanted to be alone with him again. Number three and the left on number 54 identified herself. So number 54, there's like three women in the picture. So she called in and identified herself. A couple of them turned out to be his ex-wives, which he had four of, by the way. Red flag. Another would be Nika LaRue, who would come forward and claim one of the pictures as her. And her sister is actually Eka LaRue from CSI Miami. Nika claimed that she had been lured by Bishop after he said he wanted to photograph her. After which she said that he raped her, but that she escaped him. I also read that CSI did an episode called Dark Room that was based off of Bradford. And I actually saw this. And when I was researching this case, I was like, this seems so familiar. And then when I read that, I went and looked at the episode and I was like, yep, that's exactly why. Number 28 was a 31-year-old mother of two, Donna Lee Campbell Dumal. She had disappeared in 1978 in Culver City, California. She had gone to a bar called The Frigate with her boyfriend when she went up to the bar. It was there that she met a man who claimed to be a photographer, and he offered her a modeling photo shoot. She told her boyfriend, and he said, okay, while distracted in a pool game. And when he finished the game, she was gone and would never be seen again. Mm. When she was reported missing, police were unable to find anyone that could give a description of the man she had been talking to. But eight days later, and 30 miles away, a jogger would find her body. She was decapitated and dumped in garbage bags in a canyon near Malibu. I'm wondering if the jogger looked in the bags or if he just, like, called police. He had to have looked in the bags, right? Oh, my God. The coroner believed that she had been strangled. Bishop, however, either way, would die of cancer in March of 2008 while awaiting his execution. And there were 14 unidentified women on the board at the time of his death. He did at one point, by the way, offer to help police, but they declined because he had misled, lied, and manipulated them so many times that they were just like, we don't believe anything he says. Yeah. When they had seven left, they would hold another press conference. They also did release a second board at some point, by the way, but I couldn't find a photo of that board. Now, if you remember, allegedly Bishop did confess to murdering 23-year-old Misha Stewart. Bishop had met Misha at a bar, and the two of them had gone to his trailer that was parked nearby. It would be the next day that Misha would be found naked and dead in the alley. He had been strangled with an unknown ligature. 
but they were unable to find physical evidence that linked Bishop to the murder. So without evidence, they don't know if Bishop actually committed this murder or if he was trying to get more attention or trying to get the death penalty faster, which I would think this would slow it down, not make it faster, because if they did find evidence and he was responsible, they would want to charge him. Another crime that Bishop might be responsible for. In 2013, four skeletons were found in two shallow graves in the desert. And I'm not sure if they just think that he could have done it or if they have any evidence that actually points to him or if they're like, relative area, desert, women. It was probably Bishop. Yeah. You know, we also know there's a lot of murderers in California. He also traveled around a lot and was a photographer from the mid-60s until he was arrested in 84. So there's a lot of ground to cover, and there are still a lot of women who have not been identified from his photos, which is just so fucking scary. Think of how many people he could have killed. So many. My God. So Bishop would earn the name the Death Row Poet, and he would write poetry and send it to the newspapers. Castrate yourself. Cool. Cool. And as a special treat, here's uh, one of his poems that was published in the newspaper. Many nights I have dreamt of death, greeting me with welcome comfort, tempered with a searing seduction. Within these dreams, I have discovered a private, serene, extreme place, which dissolves the last drop of fear. Barf. Die. Either way, that is the case of William Bradford. Definitely go and look at the pictures. Your grandma, your mother might be in one of these pictures. Not even kidding. Go and check them out. It's pretty crazy. There are a lot of women who realize that they were almost like victims of Ted Bundy and stuff after Ted Bundy exactly. was arrested. Exactly. Like they, they realized that they were in a situation where they 100%. were like... 100%. But yeah, that is the story of William Bradford. We're going to click over to our bunker talk and hopefully not talk about castration anymore, but that's I'm where we're going. I'm only going to talk about castration. So come and see us there. If you want to hear more, come support us on Bunker Talk, on Bunker Talk, on Patreon, where you get Bunker Talks on all of our episodes. You get your bonus episodes. We just covered a case. We just covered the case of April Tinsley on our Patreon, which is freaking nuts so go and check that out and yeah thanks for tuning in we will talk to you guys soon bye i think the fall is actually proving to be more of a distraction than anything <laughs> well there's a hair wrapped around it right no, now I that's know. my fucking problem I'll just add the hair to the wall because I put my hairs over there on the foam wall. Sick. They stick to the foam wall. They go I off my know. Hands. I've noticed. I'm like, why is Madison's hair floating all over the place? Um, I only have done it a few times, actually. A lot of the hairs ended up there naturally. Oh, my God. So six days after Jane Doe number 60 was found. So on June 12th. They found her body on June, July 6th. Now it's July. Wait, What? You said June. It's July. Fucking me. <laughs> I'm just going to be quiet anytime I correct you and let you, like, get all worked up about the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> okay, go. Six days after Jane Doe's 60 was found. So on July 12th. Do it, do it again. Fuck. Six days after Jane Doe 60 was fucking found! I was still laughing in the beginning of the last one, too, so it would have been ruined anyway. So, fuck it. Stop laughing. This Shut is a the nightmare. Fuck up. nightmare. Let me read my goddamn line. You're living in my nightmare right now. I want to kill it wouldn't, myself. It wouldn't be stressful if we were on a time <laughs> restraint. Like, we are running out of time. Yeah, I'm leaving. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to the store. I'm getting peanuts and I'm going home. You're getting peanuts and going home? I want to feed the crows that live outside my apartment. Don't do that. Someone already does. Don't do that. I want them to be my friends. Do you want them to die when they can't fend for themselves and you move out and nobody's giving okay, them peanuts look, anymore? If the crows, if we are to the point where the crows are dying because they need to be fed by humans, humans are already dead. Are peanuts bad for crows? No, crows like peanuts. How do you know that? Because I They're not going to bring you shiny things. 
Yes, they will. It's not going to happen. Yes, they will. Okay, well. I want the murder of crows to be When that my happens, I will eat crow. <laughs> No, that's what you don't want to do. That's wrong. That's the saying, though. Like, I will eat crow if I'm wrong. Like, that's like a saying. <laughs> do you like how I slipped that in there? It was totally, like, lost on you. I feel cheated <laughs> out of my good joke. I don't get it. I'm not old. Um, No, don't eat crows. They re- they have facial recognition. The only They remember you. Wait, they hold grudges listen. for six years. Listen, the only animal I have ever killed with my car was a fucking crow. Yeah, they all remembered you, Mom. I know. They're gunning for you. I feel like they watch me. I have had a murder of crows be my friend once. I will make it happen again. Okay. You know know the first time I did it? No. I did it at Starbucks. (laughs) Out the drive-thru window. Wait, is that why that Starbucks has so many problems with crows? So all of a sudden we started seeing I think seeing I a got couple... attacked like three times by a crow when going into that Starbucks. We saw a couple of crows one day. So I started feeding them pumpkin bread outside the window. Madison. Then it became like a daily occurrence. Every time I worked, I fed the crows out the drive through window. Pumpkin bread. Only pumpkin bread. Everybody else is like, why the fuck are these crows hanging out here? I'm going to give a warning <laughs> before we go into our side conversations on this particular episode. If you have children nearby, you might want to turn down the volume. No, your children should hear this. <laughs> you might want to put your AirPod in. You might want to pause and save this for a time this when you're alone. This isn't even an inappropriate conversation. It's about dick and balls and castration. I'm just saying some people might not want to be sitting at their desk at work and have all of a sudden... They're already you- listening to murder and rape. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> your children are listening to murder but and to rape right now. But to all of a sudden have Maddie talking about cutting your dick and balls off might not be what they That's want what's to too far for you is the castration. I That's a pretty painful procedure. You get no anesthetic, no nothing. I'm not going to disagree with chopped you. chopped the fuck off. Just your balls? No. Should be your dick too, right? I think so, but castration's technically just the balls. Well, can't you still have sex then? Technically, yeah, so but what's the point? Then you don't have your balls. You don't need your balls if you're just raping people. Actually, it's probably better because you won't be leaving semen. You'll still be leaving DNA behind, though. Yeah, but if you don't, if you're if we're not cutting off their dick, there's no point. Well, okay, so I'm just saying that castration is just the balls being chopped off. But I Are do sure? believe I'm pretty sure. Are you sure? I'm not I, sure about that. Is it the whole thing? I don't know. But I do believe that if you do get charged with, like, rape or something like that, you yeah. should have your whole bits gone. It's That's what gone. I'm saying. Instead of castration, it should just be everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I think that okay. I fully think... I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when I say castration in this term, I mean the whole thing. Though. Okay. Got it. <laughs> sure. Why not? Take the whole thing off. Either way. <laughs> God. Balls or balls and dick. Either way. I feel way. like I definitely cannot keep this in the podcast. Castration. <laughs> I say do it. I have no... I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. You can leave this whole thing in. Uh, My mom may... She doesn't have the same desensitivity that I have to, like, inappropriate things, so on and so forth. Like, um, even though no she... I have no problem talking about cutting somebody's dick off i just have a problem with doing it on the podcast okay yeah but you also do have like you do get like slightly uncomfortable being in like the tampon aisle for like too long i do or something actually like that. she's not wrong about um that, which is actually. something that i do notice with just like yeah. older people in general because or a lot of people in general because they're just not raised as that's yeah, something why that's is it normal? why do i feel embarrassed about tampons i don't even wear tampons but when i did like why did i feel embarrassed about that? because it's something that society shows you should be shameful and is gross and yeah. periods are gross i use so a cup now i I highly recommend it. I also highly recommend it. 